Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear fellow redeemed, the text for our meditation this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 63. We read verses 7 through 14. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy, and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths? Like a horse in the desert, they did not stumble. Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. Dear friends in Christ, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to depth and breadth and height and so on. Maybe you're familiar with that poem, or at least the first line of that poem is fairly familiar. I was reminded of that first line when I was reading this text from Isaiah. It's basically what Isaiah is doing here, but he, he flips it on its head. Instead of, how do I love you? He says to God, Lord, how do you love me? Let me count the ways. And then he goes on listing all these different ways that God has shown his love to his people. Looking through the text, just a number that jump out. He became their savior. He was afflicted in all their afflictions. He redeemed them. He gave them his Holy Spirit. He divided the waters for them. He, he gives them rest through his spirit. A long list of all the blessings that God does for his people out of love. And if each one of us today was to try and write down a similar list, looking back over the past year, looking at 2017, I think each one of us could come up with just as long of a list of all the blessings that God has done for us in this past year. Now what makes Isaiah's recounting of God's love more special and more amazing is actually what precedes our text today. The context really changes your, uh, your idea of what Isaiah is doing here. You see, just before this, just one breath before Isaiah starts recounting God's steadfast love, he has this really graphic picture, this really graphic illustration. He describes God as coming in a, in a white gown like this, and yet the bottom of his gown is stained red up to the knee. Now what Isaiah records is, is a conversation that he has with God. And he sees God dressed and stained with red, and he says to the Lord, Lord, why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? And God has this response. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. So God responds to Isaiah. He says, I was in the wine press, in fact. But it wasn't grapes I was trampling. I wasn't making wine. No, this was God's judgment on unbelievers. Pretty horrific, really graphic stuff that Isaiah is depicting for us here. And then the very next thing Isaiah does, after ending this, this imagery, what is the next thing he says? I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord according to all that the Lord has granted to us. <clears throat> when you're confronted 
with God's judgment, especially God's winepress judgment, as, we're see, as we see here. There's really only two things that you can do. There's two responses that you can have to God's judgment. You can do as the world does, where you look at this and figure, God doesn't exist. There's no heaven or hell or anything that I have to worry about. You make it all just one big joke so that you don't have to worry about it. Or you can do as the Christian does, and it's the only sane response. You run to Christ. You recount his gospel promises, and you know that, even though you don't deserve it, Christ has taken your place, and that you are saved from God's winepress judgment. That's what Isaiah was doing here. He gives the only sane response. He's confronted with God's clear judgment on unbelief, and he turns back to Christ and knows that he is saved. This serves as a wonderful example for us as we look back at the past year. If you look back, I'm sure there's countless blessings that you can reflect upon and be grateful for, whether it be the birth of a child or um, you know, the purchase of a new house or you know, just our, our wonderful family here we have at Emmanuel. So many different blessings that we can be thankful for. Our cups really do run over. And let's look at verses 8 through 10 again. Listen to God's blessings, like we receive, and then listen to Israel's response. Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. In 2017, God has filled our cups with blessings. And in response we often spit right in his face. Now these words that God wrote about the children of Israel 2,800 years ago, he could have written about us in 2017. Think of all the time that we spent this past year. First of all, receiving blessings from God, but then all the time that we spent not being very grateful. All the time that we spent putting our own interests ahead of other people's or God's will. Think of all the time we spent just stewing over something that we couldn't let go of, refusing to forgive someone who wronged us. A lot of wasted time this past year where we essentially spat in God's face, just like Israel did. Now the reality is true of each one of us, that we have sinned. We have rebelled against the Lord, and that winepress judgment looms ever closer. So what do we do? Well, again, there's two things we can do. We can respond as the world does and say, well, there's really no hope for me. There is no God after all. We can say, well, you know, maybe the good things I've done have outweighed the bad things. And all of these responses are only leading to one place. Or we can do as the Christian does. As Isaiah said, and it's the only sane response. We say, yes, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve this judgment, but let me recount your steadfast love as shown to me, for you are my Savior. And today, the last day of 2017, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to recount God's steadfast love as shown us through his son. First of all, looking back to how he showed that steadfast love to Israel. And then as he shows his steadfast love to us today, tomorrow, and beyond. So to begin, we'll turn to the first three verses from our reading from Matthew chapter 1. Now when they had departed, behold... An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. 
This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. That probably doesn't sound like much at first blush, at least you know, not to the greater nation of Israel. But there really is something quite interesting going on here. The text says that Joseph took his family down to Egypt to avoid a, a certain danger and eventually returned back to Israel. Does that sound like any other family that you know of? A family that recognized certain death in Israel, went for safety in Egypt, and eventually was returned back to the Promised Land. Of course, that was what happened to Jacob in his family several thousand years before this. When Jacob and his family were, were facing a famine in Israel, and Joseph had been providing for the people in the land of Egypt, so he brought his, all of his children and his family down to Egypt. They grew, and eventually the Lord brought them back. Yeah, what Jesus is doing here, going to Egypt, going back, is very intentional. God is very intentionally having him walk in the exact footsteps of his people Israel. You think about that first journey, the ones the Israelites took, Think about what happened on the way back. There's a lot of things that took place in the wilderness, but there was one thing that really stands out as being pretty important. That was what happened on Mount Sinai. God delivered a covenant to his people Israel. A covenant, a, a two-party agreement where if one party does one thing, the other party will follow through in return. And that's what he gave to Israel. And he gave Moses the terms of this covenant and told Israel through Moses, he said, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if, this is the first, this is the Israel side of the covenant, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then, this is God's response, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So if the Israelites could only keep God's law, if the Israelites could only hold up God above everything else and perfectly obey his will, then God would bless them. They would be like his own dearly beloved children. Now, of course, we know just how long they were able to keep that covenant before Moses even returned down the mountain with the two tablets of stone, the Israelites had already decided that God wasn't worth their time. They threw their gold into a pot and they crafted for themselves a golden calf and threw themselves at it in worship. And they rebelled. They broke the covenant. They couldn't be God's beloved children. Now let's turn back to Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. Speaking of Jesus again, Jesus' journey. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now the prophet he's referring to is Hosea. And Hosea, when he speaks about this, he says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. God did love Israel as his own beloved child. And so he called him up out of Egypt. But we know that Israel rebelled and took God's, uh, the sonship that God had given them and threw it away. They couldn't fulfill what God had wanted. They couldn't be his child. And so to bring fulfillment to these words of Hosea, God sends Jesus. He sends Jesus to walk in the very footsteps of his people Israel to call his own beloved son out of Egypt. And he does all this so that Israel could once again be his dear children. How did he accomplish that? He did it by going where they went, to Egypt and back. He did it by standing where they stood in the waters of the Jordan. He did it by fighting and winning spiritual battles where the Israelites had fought and lost. As they did in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus did in the wilderness for 40 days when he was tempted by the devil. And he ultimately brought the children of Israel back into God's 
loving care by going and dying where and how they ought to have died on the cross as the ransom for their sins. As God had become flesh so that fleshly people could once again become his children. So that though they failed, they'd continue to be his treasured possession just as he promised. Now this all happened between two and 3,000 years ago. What does that have to do with us in 2017? And what does that have to do with us looking forward to 2018? Well, you know, this time of year, in the last couple of days of the year, if you're on social media at all, sometimes you see these stories that people post. You know, it's the My 2017 story. And then they'll, they'll post all the pictures and all the places you went and all the things you, you posted online throughout the whole year. A nice encapsulation of, of just what type of things you did in the previous year. This account of the children of Israel and they are being bought back as children of God. This, on a grand scale, is your 2017 story. We'll take a look at that as we read it from God's steadfast love as shown to us. We'll be reading from Galatians 4, which is our epistle reading. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Are you planning on making any New Year's resolutions this year? It's a, something that a lot of people like to do this time of year. Resolutions like eat, more, eat healthier, drink less soda, exercise every single day. Sometimes Christians make resolutions of a different nature. Sometimes we resolve to try and amend our sinful ways. We say, Lord, I'm going to try and be more patient this year. Lord, I'm going to try and show more love to my family this year. Lord, I'm going to try and read your word every day this year. Such resolutions are good to make because they fit in with what God wants for us when he says, you shall be perfect, for I, the Lord your God, am perfect. These types of resolutions we might even make on a daily basis when we struggle under the weight of our sin and we resolve to do better next time. Now, if this was a resolution that you made last year, I can guess at how well you did. Just like me, just like the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, it probably was not very long at all until you'd already slipped right back into your sinful ways. Until you'd stumbled right back into that very same sin that you promised you'd do better again do better at. Like the children of Israel, we cannot be the children that God demands us to be. We cannot be faithful like he expects us to be. And no, rather than being his children, as he says here in Galatians, we're more like slaves. Slaves to our own sins, slaves being led in chains to that wine-press judgment that Isaiah depicted. And as Isaiah wrote about the children of Israel, he can say about every single one of us, Surely you're my people, children who will not deal falsely. And I became your Savior. In all your afflictions I was afflicted, and the angel of my presence saved you. In my love and in my pity I redeemed you. I lifted you up and carried you all the days of old, but you rebelled and grieved my Holy Spirit. Yes, that's very true of us. And yet here is where God's love shines through. Because rather than rejecting us, when we rebel against him, what does Galatians say? He redeems those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. He paid the price to set us free from these chains. 
He paid the price with his own blood. And now we are his children through adoption. I remember when I was younger, I used to think that <clears throat> that adoption was something embarrassing. And because uh, the way that you know, sometimes brothers and sisters will make fun of each other, they'll say, well, you're adopted. And it was, it was really a foolish thing for me to think anything weird about adoption. But it was such that if I knew a child who was adopted, I never wanted to say anything to him. I could talk to him about anything, but I would never bring up the fact that he was adopted because I thought it would be embarrassing to him. And yet, think about an orphan child. Put yourself in his shoes for a second. You're an orphan who has given up all hope of finding a family to love you. And then you hear those wonderful words. Congratulations. You've been adopted. This is exactly what God says to each one of you today. When he paid his blood in your place, when he took your place on the cross, he bought you back from slavery and made you his own dear children. Congratulations. You've all been adopted. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, the Hebrew word, which is kind of like our English word, Daddy. And the way a toddler can approach his dearly beloved father, God tells us now that, yeah, that's how we can approach him. And his steadfast love continues to each one of us. His steadfast love was poured out on all of us this past year, and it continues now. It continues today as we hear his holy word, and his spirit uses that word to strengthen our faith, to assure us that we have been forgiven, and that we are his dear children. And that steadfast love continues. But now the question is, today is the last day of 2017. We know God has taken care of us this past year. But what if we mess up? What if we somehow compromise that in the coming year? What if we sin so badly that God decides no longer is he going to love us, no longer is he going to care for us, just no longer. That's it. What if that happens? What if during this coming year you are tempted to give up all hope and just assume that before God you don't have anything other than judgment coming? Well, if you find yourself thinking that this coming year, there's two ways you can react. You can do as the world does and give up hope. Just continue in sin. To just assume that it's hopeless for you and it doesn't matter what you do anyways. Or you can do as the believer does in faith. You can recount God's steadfast love. You can cling to that cross and know that because of what Christ has done, all of your sins are covered. Not just the ones from this past year, but the ones that are in the year to come. You can recount God's steadfast love as shown to each one of you. And know, as he promises, that it will continue in every year. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Thanks be to God for the wondrous, steadfast love that he has shown us in 2017. And he will continue to show you that same love, with those same blessings, in the coming year as well. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you.